you know, in our business, uh, and like many other businesses, I mean, you've got to adjust, adjust, adjust. I mean, uh, don't be afraid to adjust when something doesn't work and pull the plug and pull the plug quickly. Um, you know, I always try and preach to our managers, you know, don't be afraid to make a decision. Um, you know, wh whether it's the right decision or the wrong decision, uh, it's better than no decision most of the time. So let's make a decision and move on and, and, and let's do the best that, that we can. And if it ends up being the right, wrong decision, then, then we'll make an adjustment. Welcome to the Attraction Pros Podcast, where we discuss the latest trends and challenges facing the attractions industry today. We chat with some of the top leaders in the field and provide resources that will help develop your career in this great industry. I am Josh Liebman. I am obsessed with the guest experience and helping attractions make that their top priority for success. And I'm Matt Heller. I am passionate about organizational effectiveness, leadership development, and employee engagement. Now sit upright, hold on tight, and get ready for the Attraction Pros Podcast. Hey, Matt, how's it going? It's going fantastically. Josh, how about you? Wow, you really changed it up there at the end. You turned an adjective into an adverb, I believe. That's how I roll. There you go. Good. Question for you. Yes. Wait, you, how are you? Are you need an answer. Oh, I'm doing very well. Thanks for asking. All right, good. All right, now you can ask me. <laughs> what difference does it make how I am as long as you're doing fantastic or fantastically? It, so. it makes a big difference. Right. In the year 2019. Yes. It was, it was a good year. It was like, it was like the last good year. I remember that. I yeah. remember that. Throughout that entire year, at any point, did you visit a flea market? Oh, I knew you were going to ask me that question. I don't think I did. However, I think I might have visited one the year before. 2018. 2018. Yeah. Um, but I have a friend that goes to a flea market every Saturday morning at 6 a.m. Wow. Yeah. That's amazing. Yeah. What do they do? What do they, I mean, do they just come back with all kinds of crazy good stuff? <laughs> well, he goes for very specific material. He's looking for like military memorabilia or, um, you know, like old gun casings or bullets or, you know, anything military he's looking for. And there's a couple of dealers at this particular uh, flea market near where we live in North Carolina, that there's a couple of uh, dealers that have that kind of stuff and they're usually there early in the morning and he likes to get there before you know too many people get there to pick through everything so he goes there every single saturday and sometimes he comes home with nothing sometimes he comes home with some little treasure that he found sounds like a good like saturday morning like tradition and and like an amazing hobby i guess right? yeah yeah yeah, yeah. Um, I also did not visit a flea market in 2019. <laughs> I don't think I visited one in 2018 either, but I heard a stat recently that is in the future, if you're listening to this now, that 52% of Americans visited a flea market in 2019, which is pretty impressive considering the guest that we have today, Tim Anderson, the president of Trader's Village, which is three flea markets in Texas, Dallas, San Antonio, Houston, and it's interesting because we don't normally talk about flea markets on this podcast, do we? We don't. However, this is not your normal flea market. In fact, I would say this flea market that Tim is running, the three, is a few steps above the flea market that we have here in North Carolina. Mm. Uh, because the way he describes it and the way he describes it really wants me, wants, makes me want to visit. Um, there's food, there's festivals, there's, you know, and, and you can get anything from a ballpoint pen to a bulldozer at his flea markets. And, you know, just to think about all the different ways that you can spend a day and, you know, maybe get some stuff that you need or just, you know, entertain your family or get some good food. I mean, it sounds like a great experience. Yeah. And you didn't even mention the machete tacos, which I think are <laughs> probably sound worth it alone to go. Not to mention, they have rides too. Yep. So these flea markets are 100% attractions. And Tim is 100% an attractions guy, an attraction pro, if you will. Uh, prior to Trader's Village, he was with Kima Boardwalk. He had been with Six Flags. He had been with uh, Kellogg Cereal City in Battle Creek, Michigan. And uh, he's now with Trader's Village and talking about everything 
uh, related to running a flea market with rides. And what I think is cool is that he started out like many of us, right? He started out on the front lines of the theme park and you can really tell the way he talks about um, Trader's Village that he's using a lot of that experience in the way that he operates his, his flea market Although he will be quick to tell you it's not a theme park, right? It's different and they're very different experiences. Uh, but I think the way he is um, incubating small businesses and the way he's providing jobs and all the wonderful things that he's doing for the community um, really get a sense that, you know, for an attraction to be successful, it doesn't have to be a theme park, zoo, aquarium, water park, the ones that we typically list, right? You can have a flea market with 3,500 dealers and you can have some rides and you can have some amazing food and it can be an attraction. People that people are attracted to come to it to spend the day and have a great experience. Yeah. Not to mention the numbers that they pull in and only being open on the weekends. Yeah. I, it's, it's just absolutely crazy. So yeah, no, this is just such an amazing conversation where we talk about the parallels between flea markets and amusement parks or large attractions and where there's some comparisons and where there are some distinct non-comparisons where, where there's some very unique attributes of each of them. So I'd say let's get uh, straight to this interview with Tim Anderson. And then we're going to get a machete taco. Hey, Tim, welcome to the Attraction Pros podcast. We're so excited to chat with you today. How are you? I'm great. Thank you guys so much for having me today. So, Tim, as we get started here, uh, can you give us just a, a quick background and overview of your career as we uh, jump into what I feel like is going to be an exciting and wide-ranging interview? Yeah, sure. You know, I started a, a, like a lot of other people in the industry. I, I started when I was in high school, when I was 16 years old. I worked at... Uh, the Six Flags Park in Houston, Texas. I, I was a game operator. Uh, I worked in Houston at the Six Flags Park. I worked through all through high school. Uh, and then I worked, uh, continued to advance seasonally and worked all the way through uh, college. And then when I graduated college, you know, I, I had always, you know, kind of planned on being a lawyer. And that, that was kind of the expectation that I was going to go to law school. Uh, but I kind of came to a fork in the road once I graduated, once I got my degree, you know, I had a degree in economics. So, you know, I could go work at a bank and, and be an economist. And I had an opportunity to do that. Uh, or I could go to law school. Uh, and, you know, I came to kind of realize uh, closer to closer and closer to, to the possibility of going to law school that I really didn't want to be a lawyer. And then the third possibility is I could uh, continue to work at Six Flags and make half as much money. Uh, so, you know, the park was great. You know, they, they gave me an opportunity to, to enter management when, when I graduated from, from college and, uh, you know, ended up paying for my graduate school. And, you know, that, 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 was, a, that was a great decision. Uh, so, you know, I worked in management at Six Flags in Houston for, for a couple of years, uh, not, not too long. Uh, once I finished my, my graduate school degree, you know, I had an opportunity to go to the Six Flags Park in uh, uh, Gurney, Illinois, uh, Six Flags Great America. And uh, I was there for five or six years. Uh, so my total time at Six Flags was about 17 years. From there, I went and did a, a project that probably not a whole lot of people know about. I did a project for the, uh, the Kellogg Cereal Company in uh, Battle Creek, Michigan. You know, help them open a, a corporate heritage center, and I was the general manager of that facility for, for uh, about a year and a half, two years. Uh, that that was a, an opportunity to build something. You know, it was a it was a development project. You know, I was more interested in, in getting experience to to learn how to to build stuff like that as to opposed to uh, to to running it. So I ran it for a little while, and then at at um, some point, I had an opportunity to. Uh, Joined the, the Landry's group, uh, you know, the Landry's restaurant group as the, uh, the executive in charge or the general manager of uh, the Kima Boardwalk, uh, which uh, the Kima Boardwalk is, uh, is a resort, an amusement property, a restaurant property uh, in Kima, Texas, uh, which is on Galveston Bay. And, and Kima is located uh, south of Houston, north of Galveston. Um, and that was an interesting property as well. You know, I ran that for 12 years. Um, and then I had an opportunity to, uh, to come work at Traders Village as the president of the three Traders Village locations. And I've been at Traders Village as the, the head flea, running the flea markets at 
for Traders Village for, for the last 12 years almost. Awesome. Tim, can you give us um, a little bit of background about Traders Village? Uh, some people know it as a flea market, but um, it's much more than that. So can you gotta give us the rundown? Yeah, we're, we're kind of the, you know, the Rodney danger field of, of the attractions in, industry, you know, uh, you know, we, we, we get no respect. But then when you start talking to people about it, you, you quickly get some respect. You know, Traders Village was started in 1973. Uh, so, so we've been around for, for, for almost 50 years. It was started in uh, Grand Prairie, Texas. Uh, and it, it eventually grew, you know, we, we also have a, a flea market, a large flea market in Houston, Texas, and, a, and another one in San Antonio. So, so we have three of them. Uh, these properties are, uh, are large, uh, you know, they're, they're about 210 acres or so average, you know, if you were to average to three. Uh, and when the owners first opened the one in, in Grand Prairie, Texas, you know, they envisioned uh, Traders Village as being the Disneyland of flea markets. And believe it or not, they, they use that slogan, the Disneyland of flea markets on their bumper stickers and their brochures for about the first three or four years that they were open until Disney told them to stop. <laughs> um, you know, and, and that's really what they tried to achieve. You know, they, they tried to, to make a, a flea market that was, was a lot bigger than anything that had been seen before, a lot cleaner, a lot better, a lot more exciting and a lot more interesting. Uh, and when I say, you know, what gets people's attention in the amusement industry is, uh, you know, among the three flea markets in Texas here, uh, you know, we'll do this year, we'll probably do a little over 6 million people this year uh, among the three flea markets. Now, keep in mind, we are only open on Saturday and Sunday. So we're only open two days a week and, and we are not open at night on Saturday or Sunday. So uh, that's 6 million people and about 18 hours a week. Uh, so that's, that's pretty impressive. Uh, you know, Traders Village is, is a, a value-oriented or proposition. You know, our customers are, are, are looking for a value. They're looking for a bargain. Um, so our target audience is really, really everyone. You know, there was a study that came out a, a couple months ago that said that 52% uh, of all Americans had visited a flea market in the year 2019. So our target audience is everyone. But I will tell you, you know, our, our best customer is kind of a, a customer that, that's frequently cast off really, really by the hospitality business. Uh, you know, it's, it's largely a lower income demographic. You know, our folks are, are, are not, you know, breaking the bank in terms of income. Uh, and, and they're also, uh, you know, Hispanics really love a flea market. So, uh, you know, we're in Texas, there are a lot of Hispanics and, and there are a lot of Hispanics in, in our audience. So uh, what makes the Trader Village a little bit unique, you know, you know, we've got really four pillars of our brand. Uh, you've got the shopping, uh, you've got special events, uh, you've got food service, and you've got rides. So if you kind of take each one of those in turn, the, the shopping, you know, we, we say that you can buy anything from uh, uh, a ballpoint pen to a bulldozer at Trader's Village. You can literally buy anything. Uh, you know, there are used cars for sale. Uh, there's got car parts. Uh, you know, there's clothing, obviously. There's craft items. Uh, you can buy four-wheelers. You can buy fruit. You can buy any sort of household thing that you can imagine. You can buy furniture. You can buy mattresses. Just, just throw a, a topic, uh, you know, a, a topic or a, you know, a, a shopping category out there, and, and we have it in our three Trader Village locations. So there, there's a lot of shopping, um, you know. There, there's a lot of opportunities for folks to save money. Uh, one thing that uh, you know on the shopping side that, that makes it a little bit interesting is, you know, we're, we're really the uh, ultimate place to, to re ultimate recycler. You know, we keep more stuff out of landfills than almost anybody else in the planet. You know, so uh, if, if people have stuff, stuff that they're almost going to throw away, do they come out here and have a garage sale type booth and, you know, and sell it? So the, the second pillar of the brand that I mentioned is events. You know, we have lots and lots and lots of events. Um, 
and during the pandemic right now, you know, we're, we're not having quite, quite as many, but, uh, you know, we, we're, we continue to have, have events. Uh, we uh, have everything. We have an, a big Indian powwow that we do that's pretty interesting. People like that. We do a foot ton of food events. We do a barbecue fest. We do chili cook-offs. Uh, we, uh, we do a shrimp fest. Uh, a couple years ago, I had the bright idea to do a lobster fest. Uh, you know, if it can be cooked, we, we, we pretty much come up with an event to go around, around that food. Uh, we also do a ton of car events. You know, we have car shows. That, uh, I think it was last weekend or the weekend before uh, we had a, uh, a Volkswagen rally in San Antonio. And my goodness, I did not know there were that many Volkswagens in the entire planet. You know, they literally had a thousand Volkswagens show up. And these things were uh, tricked out, buffed up. Uh, you, you just could not even believe some of the Volkswagens that were there. So we do a ton of events. Uh, you know, th food, you know, that's kind of the third pillar of our brand. You know, we do, we do food pretty well. I, I would, you know, I, you know, I try to be as humble as possible, but, but we probably do food better than, than most uh, theme parks do. You know, we've got some food that, that's really pretty good, you know, especially some of our Hispanic flavors. You know, we have a, a, a machete taco uh, that is uh, about 24 inches long. You know, it's named a, a machete taco because it's the length of a machete. And it's cooked right there in front of you on, on a big, big flat top round kettle grill. Uh, and all of the ingredients are cooked fresh and served to you. And it is piping hot when it comes up the grill. And we just got a lot of food like that, you know, that people really, really enjoy having. You know, and the other thing that uh, about our food operation is uh, the beer is cold. The margaritas are cold and we sell a bunch of it. Uh, so, you know, really the last pillar of the brand, you know, is kind of a, almost a, a new pillar really since I've arrived uh, about uh, is the rides. You know, we operate amusement rides at our property. Uh, each of our uh, properties has, you know, between 10 and 15 rides. Uh, all of the rides are, uh, you know, park model rides. You know, there's, there's not any, you know, carnival or portable rides on the property. They're all park, park models. Uh, so, you know, we're, we're in that business as well. You know, and the ride business, you know, the way we approach the ride business is, is the, the, the rides are really an amenity for us. You know, it's something for the, the, the shoppers to do, for the shoppers' kids to do. And what we found is it's, it's just like anything else. I mean, we're looking for in-park stay. The longer that we can get people to stay, you know, the more money they're going to spend with our dealers, the more money they spend with our dealers, really, you know, the, the more money they make, the more money we make. Um, so so that's, that's kind of in a nutshell, um, you know, the business. Uh, you know, we're, we're kind of in the real estate business. Our, our biggest source of income at Traders Village is, is what we call space rental. You know, we rent space for people to sell stuff. Uh, and there's, there's three different types of space. You know, there's what we call lock space, which you're, you're in a garage and there's a garage door and you can lock that thing up when you leave and you, you rent that by the month. Uh, and, you know, you don't have to clean up anything, you know, at the end of the day, you know, you just close your door and you go home. There's also what we call covered space, which is, you know, you're under a, a big pavilion. Uh, but at the end of the weekend, you got to clean up clean it up and take it home with you, everything you got. And then we also rent what we call open space, which is uh, nothing, um, you know, it's a space in the parking lot essentially with, with nothing but uh, the sky above, you know, you bring your own tent and it, but again, you know, you, you, you got to clean that up by the time you go home. Uh, you know, we've got dealers that, that have been uh, with us for uh, over 45 years. Um, you know, so, you know, they like it uh, and they do well. Uh, really, Traders Village is uh, in the business of uh, small business development or, uh, you know, we're a small business incubator. You know, there are thousands and thousands of, of businesses that are started here every year. You know, most of them don't make it. But, you know, you've also got businesses that do make it. And, uh, 
you know, we've got, we've seen people grow from the flea market to, you know, they're very, very successful businesses. You know, we had, uh, you know, there's a furniture chain that started here at Traders Village and, and you know, and now they're, they're a multi-million dollar operation, you know, probably tens of millions of dollar operation. So, um, you know, that's kind of, uh, that's kind of a Traders Village in a nutshell. I'm sure I missed a lot, but uh, y'all can certainly ask questions. No, that's really interesting. We, we appreciate that level of detail too. Um, and I'll just say, first of all, it sounds like Traders Village is worth it alone just for the food and for the food events and festivals. Right. So that right there has, has my gears turning out. Oh, that's, that's why I want to visit. Um, and I'll also say as, as kind of a separate side note as well, you mentioned Kellogg Cereal City earlier. I actually did visit that uh, when I was a child, came home with my face on a cereal box. So that just kind of brought back a memory when you mentioned that uh, you know a, a few minutes ago or earlier in the interview that, um, was, uh, that was interesting project because that was really hard to do getting to that face on a cereal box yeah. <laughs> that right so i i meant i've never met really anybody that had done that so that's hey. great. <laughs> i i'm sure if i were to ask my mom she probably has it in storage somewhere it sat on a shelf it was on display for many many years i don't even remember if there was cereal in it or not but i think there there may have been sure, there was cereal in it. yes <laughs> i wouldn't need it at this point but yes there's <laughs> no <laughs> One of the things that I'm wondering um, if you can expand on a little bit is, uh, you know, you talk about the rides portion of the business and you said that the rides are an amenity uh, because there are so many other pillars of the operation, the, the flea market and the shopping, the food, the events. Um, and it seems like that, you know, that is enough to draw so many people. You said, you know, 6 million people across the three properties each year uh, just on operating on the weekends. I, how does the... Uh, how do the rides relate to Traders Village in the same way that, or, or maybe how does that differ is what I'm trying to say compared to, uh, you know, another major park, Kima or, or Six Flags, uh, and it being an amenity uh, for, you know, for your guests who are visiting? You know, it really kind of adds, a, you know, a whole new uh, demographic that's, that's interested in the property. You know, our, the way we work the rides is that the rides are, are, are really inexpensive. So, um, you know, in San Antonio, in, in Houston, the, the, the ride risk band is, is 1099 for all you can ride, rise all day. So it is a value oriented proposition. And Grand Prairie, you know, we're at 1399 right now. And again, you can ride the rides all day. And Grand Prairie, you know, I think we've got 15 rides and some of them are pretty big and we're getting ready to, to grow that operation a little bit more. We're at, getting ready to add a, uh, uh, a roller coaster to the mix, uh, which is pretty exciting. Uh, so, you know, it, it has kind of grown the demographic, you know, it's, it's kind of expanded it into, uh, you know, more general market as, as versus, uh, you know, the, the narrower, narrower uh, value oriented market, I guess, would be a good way to, to, to say it. Mm -hmm. You know, it's expanded the number of folks that are interested in, in coming out to see the property. Tim, you mentioned that roller coaster, and that's one of the things that I wanted to ask you about because that came at about came about at a time when a lot of other people were tightening their belts here in 2020 and 2021, as the pandemic is is um, you know in full swing, if you will. Um, so many people are looking for ways to save, and you're looking to expand and and put in a roller coaster. So I'm curious, kind of what went into that decision making process. You, you know, really, we kind of felt like uh, when the going gets tough, the tough get going. And it was a good time. It's a good time to reinvest in our business, uh, and we have done that in a number of ways. And one of the ways that we've done that is is to invest in uh, and, and putting a roller coaster in our uh, our Grand Prairie operation, our Grand Prairie property. Um, so, you know, like many other things that happened during the pandemic, there, there was a lot of equipment available for sale, and uh, you know, we we kind of sorted through that, and we came across this opportunity to buy. Uh, what used to be the, the Scandia Screamer that uh, was, was removed from that property when it closed a, a number of years ago. Uh, and we really saw that that EMF Milo coaster was just really a perfect match for our demographic. You know, it, it kind of just had the, just the right amount of giddy up and the footprint was almost perfect. You know, we were looking for something that was about 300 feet long and about 70 feet wide and, and, and it was just almost dead on the, the footprint that we were looking for. Um, good reputation, you know, people really liked the ride. 
Uh, so, so we were really excited to get it. Um, we're not done putting it in, and I don't know how long it's going to take us to finish putting it in, uh, but, but we're excited to get it. And, and I think it'll be a really good addition to Grand Prairie. What do you think it'll do uh, as far as um, the perception of what Traders Village is in the in the community and being known as a flea market. And the reason I ask is, uh, many years ago, I, I recall being at IAPA and seeing uh, John Airy Sr. sitting on a panel. He was the uh, owner of uh, Fun Spot in Orlando, and they had just installed a roller coaster for the first time. And uh, they had gone from family entertainment center to he said we you know we we can't call ourselves an FEC anymore. We're now an amusement park. Uh, do you anticipate that that is happening as well? As in, it's no longer a flea market and would become an amusement park, or is it still flea market now with even more more rides that can you know serve even more demographics? You know, it's a game changer uh, for sure. You know, I I can tell you I, I've personally seen. How, how a roller coaster changes the game a lot because, you know, when I was at the Kima Boardwalk, we, we added a, a wood roller coaster about midway through my tenure there. And it, it completely changed the, 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 the operation there. You know, it, uh, it, it almost uh, tripled the sales and it, it, it just really turned the operation into to something completely different. Uh, so I think that you, you're definitely going to see some of that in Grand Prix. I think that you know, people will, will definitely notice it. And I, and I think it makes the wristband a, a lot more uh, uh, interesting. And I think it, uh, it, it'll be an exciting addition to the property, that's for sure. Um, you know, one thing that we, we will do uh, in Grand Prairie, and I don't know exactly when we're going to kick it off, is that you're going to see the rides in the Grand Prairie market uh, open outside of regular flea market hours. Now, we don't have that completely figured out. But I suspect you'll probably see us open for, for spring break. I think you'll probably see us open a couple nights a week during the summertime, you know, where the rides only are open. And we're uh, kind of rebranding the, the ride area in Grand Prairie. We're uh, you know, come up with a, a brand name for the ride area and we're gonna market it as a, a little bit separately occasionally from, from the flea market. We're gonna call the ride area the Prairie Playland for, you know, since we're in Grand Prairie. And we're adding the Prairie Screamer, which is a roller coaster. So uh, it'll be interesting to see what that what that does. But I, I agree, you know, it, it should be transformational, and it should change the game quite a bit. Tim at uh, at Kima, that was the Silver Bullet, was it the, the Boardwalk Bullet? The Boardwalk Bullet, yeah. The boardwalk yeah. Bullet. That that's it. That was a great coaster. I rode that a couple of years ago. You know, that was a, that was an exciting project to work out work on. You know, uh, working with the Gravity Group on that project. Uh, you know, I, I told those guys that, uh, you know, I wanted it to be uh, taller than the Texas Cyclone, faster than the Texas Cyclone, and, and, and come in with, uh, you know, the same length of uh, track as the Texas Cyclone, and we wanted to do it in half the space. And they kind of scratched their head and said, well, we don't know if we can do that. And uh, they thought about it for 48 hours, and they called us back and said, oh, yeah, absolutely, we can do it. So it was... Uh, it was an exciting project. That was a tough project to build. You know, uh, when that thing was being built, it, it literally rained almost every single day during construction. And when it wasn't raining, it was, it was about 115 degrees. And in the middle of it, we had a tropical storm. So it was, a, it was something different to build. Definitely, definitely. Well, I wanted to dive a little deeper also into your um, your your dealers, because uh, as I understand it, you have about thirty five hundred different dealers that you deal with. Um, I think that's just at Grand Prairie. I could. That's be just at Grand Prairie. Yeah. You know, on any given weekend, we could have between the three, we could have up to six thousand dealers. Yeah. And you mentioned that some of them have gone on to, you know, create incredible businesses, but what's that process like to deal with that many different entities that are still under the Traders Village umbrella and brand? You know, you know, it's interesting, uh, you know, so, so some dealers, uh, you know, they rely on us to do all of the advertising. Uh, there's other dealers that, that do, do all of their own advertising. You know, we really look at ourselves as being a small incubator, small business incubator. We're a great place to start. I can't think of any place else in America where you can go someplace and for a hundred dollars you can start a business, and that you can start, you can lease space here and get started for less than a hundred dollars. Uh, you, all you need is a, a good idea and the willingness to 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 work hard. 
you know, the one thing that I really like about the flea market business, it's a little bit different than, than the theme park business and, and uh, is that, uh, you know, we have an opportunity to help people. We, we have an opportunity to lift people up. Uh, and and it's, it's very interesting. We love seeing people succeed. We love people seeing people be successful. You know, we're building jobs, we're building companies, you know, and, and it, it's, you know, it's, it's, it's a passion. And uh, we, we love it. I think you mentioned a few minutes ago, there was a, you said there was a furniture company that started at, at Traders Village that went on to, you know, kind of expand beyond the, the footprint of the, of the flea market. And wondering if there are any other just inspiring stories that you love to share of people that, that started their business and were able to, to grow it and have their roots at Traders Village. Yeah, I, I, you know, there, there's a, a ton of businesses that have started. Um, at Traders Village, and you know, one day I should write a book. You know, one one of my recommendations was is uh, if you're a younger manager and you're just getting started in in uh, in this business, uh, you should journal which what whatever happens to you. Just between the things that have happened to me at Six Flags and in Kima, and at, uh, certainly at Traders Village, you know, there's just hundreds and hundreds of different stories that 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 uh, I could tell. Unfortunately, I've forgotten most of them. So, uh, you know, I, I think it's important if, 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 if you're in this industry, I, I would suggest that you journal. Uh, but, but getting back to your question, I mean, I'm surprised every day. Um, I was uh, in a, an electronics store the other day in the mall uh, buying something, and I was having a conversation, and, and the guy sh- saw that I was wearing my Trader's Village shirt, and he said, oh, this company started at Trader's Village. And I, I had no idea uh, that, that that group had started there. So, um, yeah, you know, it, it's an interesting, and you bump, you bump into them all the time, uh, people that have started in a flea market, it, whether it's ours or, or another one. Uh, but, but it really is, you know, kind of the ultimate place to start a small business. Yeah. Well, and you mentioned that um, in addition to the dealers and you've got the rides, you've got all these other experiences for people to, um, uh, to come in and do uh, at the at Traders Village, that it is becoming a destination, right? It is becoming someplace, not only for guests to come, but also, like you said, for, for small businesses. Is that something, kind of the small business angle that you talk to dealers about when they come? Maybe it's their first time setting up and, you know, it's their first Saturday that they're going to be open and say, this could really turn into something for you. Is that kind of part of the marketing to get people in as dealers? You know, one thing that you'll find is the people that, that sell here are pretty driven. Uh, you, you don't really need to give them a pep talk. You know, mo- most, most of them, the good ones are, are, are really driven and uh, you know, they're, they're gonna be successful on their own typically. Uh, so most of the time they don't need, need a lot of help. Sometimes you have to slow them down if anything, you know, they'll get out and do things that you'd rather they not do. Uh, but uh, no, t- typically they're, they're pretty driven individuals. Awesome. Do you ever see the flea market concept being able to be replicated in existing theme parks and kind of maybe not necessarily in the exact same capacity, but if you think of just just everything you say of we're helping people start their businesses and you know really being able to kind of pursue their dreams and providing them with the audience to do it, the closest types of things I could think of would be you know at, at you know say Epcot during the Flower and Garden Festival, you'll have local artists who are there and they've got a kiosk and they're selling their art or you know things like that. Do you see? A, a place for more of that within established theme parks? Yeah, I, th- I think that, uh, that there's an opportunity for maybe a little bit of that. I mean, I think the problem that the flea, uh, the uh, problem with having a flea market inside an existing flea market or a uh, theme park is, uh, you know, the theme park is really almost too nice. Uh, and, you know, there's a lot of barriers to entry. I mean, and it's expensive to get in, it's expensive to park. And uh, our folks are, 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 our target audience is probably not gonna pay that. I mean, they're used to not having to pay a gate at all. There's no gate to get into Traders Village and, and parking's only $5. So you're not paying hardly anything to get in. Uh, the other thing to, to kind of keep in mind is, um, you know, you don't want, I mean, 
theme parks are, the reason that flea markets are successful in some cases when, when a mall is not, is, uh, you know, there's less overhead, you know, there, it's not quite as, as nice, I guess I, I would say, you know, and when people come to the flea market, you know, the perception is that everything there is a bargain, even though sometimes it's not. And when our dealers and when our customer goes into a, a, a mall, they say, oh, well, there's marble on the floors and it's fancy, you know, it's expensive here. So it's kind of a, a weird perception thing. You know, I, I don't know. I, I think that, uh, I think that there is an opportunity to do flea markety type events in the in in a theme park, but I don't think there's an opportunity for a theme park to be a flea market. No. <laughs> well, and that's why we're doing a theme park, or I mean, um, uh, um, Traders Village uh, flea market pros today. Um, but Tim, I wanted to uh, change gears just for a second because I have the great pleasure of working with a couple of folks on your team in one of my coaching groups, and they talk about your your leadership style and how you lead the team. And they say that you put a lot of faith in their abilities. So I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit about your leadership style and how you go about getting buy-in from the people on your team. Well, you know, there's, there's a lot of ways to lead folks. And, uh, you know, I'll just tell you that the way I do it, I, I don't know that if it's right or wrong. I, I just tell you that, that it's the way I do it. Uh, you know, the way I do it is that I try and surround myself with the best people possible. If, if possible, uh, you know, I like those people to be a lot smarter than I am. Uh, and, you know, so you try and hire great people and you empower them to do, your, do their job. Um, I give uh, our managers a very wide latitude in, in terms of the way they do things and how they do things. And, and I really allow them to try and make, you know, their piece of the business their own. Um, you know, one thing that I tell my folks all of the time is that I'm generally willing to try anything, anything one time, even if I don't think it'll work. Um, you know, that's not 100%, but generally we'll, we'll try almost anything one time, uh, whether it's an event or if it's a new process or, or a new way of doing thing or a new way of advertising, we'll, we'll try almost anything. So I think there's that. And then I think uh, the other thing is, uh, you know, in our business, uh, like many other businesses, I mean, you've got to adjust, adjust, adjust. I mean, uh, don't be afraid to adjust when something doesn't work and pull the plug and pull the plug quickly. Um, you know, I always try and preach to our managers, you know, don't be afraid to make a decision. Um, you know, wh whether it's the right decision or the wrong decision, uh, it's better than no decision most of the time. So let's make a decision and move on and, and, and let's do the best th that we can. And if it ends up being the right, wrong decision, then, then we'll make an adjustment. Uh, I guess uh, another philosophy that I've got is, uh, you know, I don't think you can ever save your way to success. Uh, you know, so often I've seen, you know, particularly in publicly traded companies, you know, you know, the only ex focus on the P&L really is in the middle of the P&L. It's, it's focused on the expenses, uh, where, where you try and chip away at the expenses, chip, 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 chip away, and you're so focused on that, you, you know, you kind of lose the forest for the trees. Uh, you kind of forget that you're trying to generate sales and you're trying to forget you're trying to generate gross profits. And, you know, I really feel like you can't save yourself to success. Now, I mean, it's the middle part of the PL. Expenses are a key critical part of, of the whole formula, but it's not the only part. I mean, you got to look at the big picture. You got to look at the top and the bottom and the middle of the PL. So it's more than that, just that. Um, you know, we try and do uh, business the right way. You know, we try and have a, a no spare customers kind of viewpoint. Um, you know, you know, there because right now, especially with the pandemic, there there are no spare customers. Uh, we try and uh, not to defer maintenance. You know, I have a whenever possible a no deferred maintenance policy. You know, it it doesn't get any cheaper to fix something by putting it off. 
Uh, you just end up with a whole pile of stuff that needs to be fixed instead of just one thing and it doesn't get any cheaper. Uh, and at Trader Village, you know, we, we really kind of focus on exceeding customer and exceeding dealer expectations. You know, for us, uh, that, that's, that's a little bit easier to do, uh, you know, because uh, when, you, when you walk into a flea market, let's be honest, your, your, your expectations are low. So it's relatively easy for us to exceed people's expectations. If the place is clean, they're surprised and happy. Uh, if the food is good, they're surprised and happy. You know, if the rides are great, you know, they don't expect that. They don't expect to see park model rides, the same rides that you can see in a major theme park and a flea market. They don't expect that. So let's exceed their expectations. So yeah, I'm not sure that got to everything that you were looking for. Hopefully we touched on a few things. Uh, if not, let me know and we'll, we, we can regroup. No, it was great. One of the things you, uh, you mentioned there is uh, not being afraid to try something once, which I think actually ties in really nice with the next point you made of that you can't save your way to success and can't just focus on chipping away at expenses. I think that those two can really go hand in hand. As far as... Uh, you know, trying an idea that maybe, um, you know, is, is kind, of, uh, kind of kind of an out there idea, maybe something that you wouldn't have necessarily thought of. Maybe it's not something that you 100% uh, have agreed with. Uh, do you find that many other leaders in general might have some hesitancy to do that? And how do you get over that hesitancy to try something with confidence even though you know it might actually be something that could be a, a failed strategy or a failed tactic? Well, you know, I'll tell you, I have hesitancy all the time. Uh, we just do it anyway. You know, it, it just it sort of becomes part of your DNA. Uh, you know, you just kind of, kind of, at, at some point, you kind of become numb to it and, and you, you just get to a point where, where you're willing to try just about anything. Um, I think that's kind of the way, way I, I look at that. I, I don't know that there, there's an easy way to do it. I mean, it's, it's scary every single time somebody brings something up, uh, especially if you don't think it's gonna work. But, you know, we try and talk about it, talk it, talk it around and, you know, try and give it the same, you know, the best shot of working. And one thing I'll find, I found is if you have somebody, a manager that brings something, an idea to you and, you know, you start uh, working with them in terms of how to operationalize that idea, you know, they might come to you a couple hours later or the next day or a week later and say, hey, you know what? That was a bad idea. I don't think we should try that after all. And I'm open to that as well. Uh, so, you know, it's, it's getting, getting ideas looked at from every angle, you know, analyzing the business, kind of doing a little mini P&L, you know, getting people to analyze their own ideas. That, that's sort of the way that, that I approach that. Yeah, and I would imagine um, part of my other question that you answered uh, was about buy-in. And when you get someone to analyze their own idea and then come back to say, Tim, yeah, that idea that I had, I don't think it's that great. Um, that saves you from having to say, you know, that may not be such a great idea, but now they've analyzed it and they can think more critically about it, which certainly is a skill that you have to develop as you as you kind of move up into leadership roles. So um, is that sort of part of the development process or is that just part of the way you lead and it, and it happens that you're able to develop other leaders as well? I think it's a little bit of both. I mean, you know, I view myself a lot of times as, you know, the cheerleader, the facilitator, uh, you know, the uh, kind of the let's keep everybody moving in the same direction where possible guy. Uh, and, you know, you try and give people the skills needed to, to, to analyze their own business and, and to, you know, come up with, um, come up with making that make their own decisions. And, and over time, I mean, people start to, you can see the light goes on, you know, after you've been through that process a few times. And, you know, uh, a lot of times once the light goes on, when, when they do present an idea, they've already been through the process. They, they've already thought through the thing. So, you know, that makes it a lot easier for me. And, and frequently it makes it a lot better idea too. Yeah. 
Uh, so one of the other things that we wanted to talk about as well before we uh, get towards the end of the interview was that in addition to your leadership background and everything with Traders Village and you know every, everything prior to that, Kima, Six Flags, Kellogg's, that you are also an avid blackjack player as well. Do you apply a lot of your leadership and business strategy to blackjack and vice versa? And curious as to uh, how you how you see that game and how it you know ties in with uh, you know with, with everything you do as as a leader. <laughs> well, you know I, I like to play blackjack. I don't know if I'm the world's best blackjack player or not. I, I enjoy it. You know, I, when, whenever I go uh, to the Vegas, I, I do like to play. Uh, I enjoy it. You know, I've gotten to the point where uh, you know I can usually sit down for for several hours, three or four hours, and. and um, most of the time, at the end of the day, I, I don't win a tremendous amount, but I don't usually lose a tremendous amount either. You know, I, I just enjoy the process. I enjoy playing it. You know, you have days where you win a little bit, of course, and you've got days where you lose a little bit, but, um, you know, I, I just kind of enjoy the process. Uh, I will say, you know, I, uh, I'm fairly aggressive when I play blackjack, so, you know, it's, uh, I guess, a lot like you approach a business. I mean, you know, sometimes you, you, you got to go in. Well, it sounds like that relates to you can't save your way to success, right? You can't be timid in the way that you run your business, just like you can't be timid in the way you play blackjack. Otherwise, you're going to be um, sitting there, certainly at the end of the day, with, uh, with less money than you started with. Yeah, I think that's probably right. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. So do you ever split tens against a six? I guess it would kind of depend upon, I'd have to think about that a little bit given the circumstances. <laughs> but, uh, yes, probably. <laughs> really? Okay. Yeah. I know a lot of people are either, you always do that or you never do that. Same thing with, you know, you, you always double down, you know, on, on 11 or you never double down on 11. Yeah. Um, you know, I'm a, mo I'm kind of a momentum player really, to be honest with you. So, you know, it kind of depends upon, you know, my, my rules kind of change, you know, it's kind of like running your business, you know, it depends upon the circumstances and it depends upon how things are going. And, you know, kind of my rules change a little bit as I move, move along. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. Well, there's definitely, you know, a, a lot of parallels, I would say, because, you know, with, with the game of blackjack and for those who, you know, are, are listening, if you, you know, if you know the game, if you don't know the game, it, there is definitely a, a method to it. And those people who have the method, they, they swear to the method and you, you really have to kind of sometimes get out of your own head or, you know, sometimes you can't get too excited about something that, uh, might be an exciting opportunity, but then, you know, you, you have to, you have to sometimes play the odds, which is you know, the, the same in blackjack and, you know, very similar in business too. I, I would say though, given your scenario, I would say almost never, but it could, you know, it could happen. Yeah. <laughs> Just depending upon how things are going. Right. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, Tim, talking about flea markets and machete tacos and blackjack, this has been a fantastic uh, interview. We've really enjoyed it. I hope you have too. Uh, if people wanted to know more about you or Traders Village, where would you send them? So you can always visit us at tradersvillage.com, our website. Uh, you can also find me on uh, LinkedIn. I don't uh, check it as often as I, I would like, but I'm trying to get better at that. Uh, so you can find me on LinkedIn or uh, you can find out more about Traders Village at tradersvillage.com. Excellent. Any uh, final thoughts for, uh, for our audience who's out there watching and listening? No, I think, uh, you know, we, we just all need to try and focus on getting through the pandemic and, uh, you know, seeing better times ahead, I think is uh, what, what I'm looking forward to. Yeah. The most. Excellent. Well, Tim, thank you so much for your time today. We greatly appreciate the opportunity to chat with you. And for everyone out there who is watching and listening, just remember, we are all Attraction Pros. Thanks for listening to the Attraction Pros podcast. Make sure to subscribe so you can tune in when new episodes release. And even better, please leave us a review on iTunes. For more information, visit attractionpros.com.